I think a lot of Australians don't actually realise something about the voice Labor's plan for a kind of Aboriginal only advisory parliament in our constitution. It's not the end. It won't be the end of it. Kumbaya, everything's solved. It's the beginning of something very serious and dangerous. And Prime Minister Anthony Albanese himself said it last year. It's only the first part of an agenda that's spelled out in what's called the Uluru Statement, written by a group of Aboriginal activists, which Albanese said on election night and later at the Gama speech, he backed in full. Because that statement also calls for a treaty and a makarata, a supposed truth-telling commission. But a kind of Aboriginal parliament then negotiating a treaty with the real parliament, what's that about? I mean, where exactly is all this going? One of our most prominent legal figures has tried to answer these critical questions in a submission to a parliamentary committee on The Voice. Here's Terence Cole. He's a former judge on the New South Wales Court of Appeals, and he presided over two royal commissions. He joins me now. The Voice. Now, we've had many legal experts get involved in this and and say, you know, they're talking about the wording and the implications and the structures and all this kind of stuff. But can I go back to the very first thing about this, the principle of it, dividing Australians by race under the Constitution? What's your view? My view is entirely wrong in principle, and it's particularly wrong since the end of World War II, when Australia has spent... Uh, considerable time, 70 to 80 years, trying to establish a multicultural society. And we've succeeded, succeeded beyond the greatest expectations of probably either Australia or the rest of the world. But we've managed to assimilate something like uh, 190 odd different nationalities. And we've done so because we have eliminated the concept of race from our thinking. People sometimes forget that um, after World War II there was a recognition that we were a country based in Asia and a country which had many nationalities surrounding us. We imported thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to assist us in the development of our country and they were all of different races and we put them all together and now the first time, certainly since that all began, we have a situation where it is proposed that we should amend the Constitution to separate Australians into two groups based entirely on race and to give to one group who represent a minority a right to influence or seek to influence changes in legislation which other Australians don't have. I think that's wrong. It'll be divisive of our society. It'll be uh, difficult for people to get on together. It will cause animosity. And uh, my personal view is it's just entirely wrong in principle. We should treat all Australians as equal in every respect. Can I ask you now, it isn't just that we're going to have a voice. The Prime Minister said he embraced all of the Uluru, Uluru Statement from the heart, which I don't think many Australians are familiar with, what it entirely encompasses. Now, where do you think this is going? Because it's going to have, include... His, the, the rest of the agenda is a treaty as well as a truth-telling commission, whatever that is. Uh, we will, it seems to me, have a machinery, uh, a sort of... Uh, de facto parliament, advisory, sure, for the moment, that will then negotiate a treaty to divide up, I'm not sure what, uh, land or whatever. It's the machinery for a different kind of citizenship in this country based on race. What do you make of the rest of this agenda? Well, I think one of the great problems is that people have not read the Uluru Statement from the Heart I suspect if you ask around, you'll find very few have. And what they are taking as being in the Uluru Statement from the heart is what they perceive to be being told by politicians and others. As you say, the Uluru Statement from the heart, 
proposes a Makarata, this treaty body, uh, sort of a truth-telling commission that's going to go through 220-odd years of uh, colonialism and then uh, rake over old grievances to find out something to complain about and something to ameliorate and maybe compensation, the whole thing. It sounds like a recipe for endless grievance and revisionism, etc., etc. But what I don't get, a lot of people listening to you will say, hey, but listen, the government and even former High Court judges are saying this, this voice is no threat. It's just there to advise. Governments won't even have to listen to it if they don't want to. Uh, there's a lot of fear-mongering going on. This voice will have no power. It's OK. What do you make of all these uh, learned judges who say, relax, it's nothing? Well, all I would say is this. There are two sides to this debate. And there are learned judges or former judges on each side. But all they are doing is expressing their opinions about how they think the High Court will interpret what is proposed at some time in the future. And in my view, it is a very brave step indeed to think that one can now accurately uh, determine what view the High Court in its present form or indeed in any future form with the changing of judges will determine in relation to the scope and um, attitudes which they would adopt in the future. And I think with great respect to all those on both sides who express a view, this is a matter which ultimately, if, it's ever, if, it, if the uh, voice succeeds, this is a matter which will be before the High Court and they will sort out all these issues. But at present, all we have is opinions from very learned people on both sides and those two opinions cannot stand together. One of them is right and one of them is wrong. I think you're entirely correct. It's like uh, opening the door. This opens the door and who can predict what will walk through it? After that, it's only opinion. You do not know. And that's the whole risk. Terence Cole, thank you so much indeed for your time. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you.